Good morning. Good morning. Thank you to Pastor James for inviting me today, and and this is the first time we've met face to face, so in person. And I was warned by Reverend Mary that you were a very kind-hearted, gracious host, um, a deep person of God, and I'm glad to find out that that was true today, our interaction. So it's good to be here with all of you um, in this space. Um, so I am. I'm one of the associate regional pastors for American Baptist Churches in New Jersey. We are 280, almost 280 churches around New Jersey, around in our region. And so I bring greetings from not just myself, but my colleagues, especially our other associate, Reverend Eric Holheisel, and our executive minister, Reverend Mary Mendez, who said very kind things about this congregation before coming in. She did warn me to watch my head when I was coming up. So... Um, but it was, uh, it's, it's great to be here with all of you today. I've been really struggling with this topic of hope recently. Um, thank you for wonderful music and the scripture reading today. Um, First Peter has been this text that I've really been wrestling with when it comes to this idea of hope. Give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect, we hear in 1 Peter. One of the Psalms has been weighing on my heart as well, from one, uh, Psalm 146, happy are those whose hope is in the Lord their God. And I think of how important it is for us, for us to be people of Christ's hope. And I find that difficult, especially right now. And what does your church offer the community? There's a congregation I was serving um, that started to give serious thought about the future of their church. This had been in conversations long before I came and started serving as their pastor. In fact, it was part of the interview process um, that they talked to me about as well. And, and I realized that we began having these conversations right away when I showed up, whether they were in meetings with the congregation or leadership meetings or even our Bible studies. We would go around in circles having conversations about what the future of the church looked like. Now everyone had their own agenda, of course, and, and so eventually we decided, well, maybe it would be best if we had somebody from the outside come in and facilitate that conversation with us. And we did, we all showed up, and we all showed up with our own agendas. The financial people came with um, nicely typed up information about the income and expenses of the church. There were people who brought information um, going back almost a decade about worship. Others came with ideas for programs, programs for adults, programs for youth. Um, even uh, the pastoral staff, we came with our own ideas. Everyone came ready to defend what was important to them about the congregation. And instead, the facilitator began by asking, what does your church offer the community? If your church closed their doors tomorrow, how long would it take for your neighbors to even realize it? Now, we were a church that cared deeply for one another, and we're all pretty independent ourselves. So we had responses for those questions. But in that moment, you could sense a change in the mood in that meeting, in that space. It shifted our focus. No longer were we discussing or arguing over our own preferences, but focusing on something more vital, something deeper that we were part of. Emily Towns, an ordained, an ordained American Baptist minister, also happens to be the dean of Vanderbilt University's Divinity School. She asks this question, she asks it specifically in an article uh, to the denomination, but it's a question that I think we could ask of any denominational group, any congregation. I think it's even one that we should ask ourselves in our own work as Christ's disciples. She challenges, she challenges um, us to, quote, 
think deeply and broadly about the why of our discipleship and the how of the mission in a world that is often chaotic. The why of our discipleship and the how in a mission in a world that's often chaotic. And I find this question challenging these days. I hear passages of hope in the scripture. I find myself reading through the Psalms and, and reading about hope, turning through these pages in scripture, and I'm not sure what to make of it. I mean, just this year alone. Actually, when I was writing this, when I was writing this the other week, I was thinking of all the mass shootings that have happened in the states and just this year alone in our country. 200 is what I came up with, more than 200, and I stopped trying to count. But just in the last four days, communities that I go on vacation to up in Chautauqua, New York, places I grew up in like Allentown, Pennsylvania, and going to their music fest, right? just over the last four days there have been shootings, there have been a stabbing, of a speaker that was at Chautauqua. There are all these things that seem to be happening, violence in our country. In April, there was a report that I remember reading about in I think CNN, it was talking about how even hate crimes in just that year alone, up until April, January to April, how hate crimes are up 76% in New York City. preaching and thinking and reflecting on hope, challenging. And yet, yet, when we are to sink into despair, we as a church are called to hope. When we would rather give up, we as a church are called to hope. When we would rather remain silent, we as followers of Jesus are called to speak up with words and messages rooted in Christ's hope when we would rather stay tucked away safely behind our own walls. We are called to step out in unknown places with the hope of Christ. We are living in a time when I think the stakes are too great to simply play church. Amen? I believe in the saying that a world at its worst needs a church at its best. And that can look like several different things. That can look like dynamic worship, the music today. It can have a compelling vision in a church. It can have stronger programs. It can be about developing better practices. It can look like committing ourselves to restorative relationships with members in our church, our families, and our community. You can always, by the way, call the region for um, those resources or to facilitate those conversations or even to mediate. It's part of what I love about the role that I'm serving in now. But I've got a secret. Not really a secret. But those things alone are not, will not be the church at its best. I mean, it might start with, it, it might, those might be the fruits, right, the fruits of a church that's living into this hope, but it starts with people who are committed to living their lives and to living in community as those whose hope is in the Lord their God. Now, this might seem like we're avoid, or I'm, I'm trying to avoid the hard work that needs to happen within our communities. And I, I think if, if that's what you're thinking, that's a fair concern. I, I feel like the word hope is thrown out a lot these days. And I, I hear it um, in, um, in different places that I've been, things, things that we're hoping for. I feel like we hear the word hope and it's almost synonymous for the things that we, we wish for. We have different hopes for our children, for our families, for our lives, for our communities, yes, even for our churches. Sometimes things turn out the way we hope for, and other times they don't turn out the way we might have expected. 
But there is something different. There is something different about hope in today's text, in today's first Peter text. This is more than just our own wishes, right? There are some differing views, by the way, on when first Peter was written. Some scholars place first Peter as being written before, um, before the persecution of Nero, uh, the early Christian community, and how this text is, this, well, first Peter is addressing some of the concerns that the early community is facing leading up to these persecutions. Others place it shortly after the persecution of Nero, saying, well, this text is addressing well, some of the things that the church had faced and looking at how they could continue to be, continue to be, well, rooted in Christian community. I would say either way for today, First Peter addresses how these early Christians can still be in community amidst severe persecution. Their lives are in danger in this text. And what does the letter tell this Christian community? Hide? Make sure you're comfortable? Make sure you stay safe? No, 1 Peter 3.15 says, whenever anyone asks you to speak of your hope, be ready to defend it. When the Bible talks about hope, it's more than wishful thinking. It's about something deeper. This is more than just pie-in-the-sky optimism. Not even Jesus, not even Jesus tries to spare the disciples of failure or disappointment. Yet sometimes we find ourselves as Christians approaching our faith with this feel-good strategy. We try to repress pessimism in the world around us. Karl Rahner, one of the most influential theologians of the last century, he says that Christians can, quote, ruin our faith, ruin our faith by adding these ideological sweeteners being peddled in society and the church. Those ideological sweeteners, he says. Makes me think of those old pink packets, right? That's supposed to be better than sugar, but tastes awful. And he says, we arrive at God's definite realm. We only arrive at God's definite realm when we pass through death. In other words, our Christian hope begins with lament. It begins with grief by honestly facing our struggles, right? Our own brokenness. By facing the fragmentation in the world around us. Too often we use the idea of hope to avoid this work, but in actuality, our Christian hope it begins here. The world facing COVID over the last two years. And we see the world responding in this, this, this cluster of human emotions, of grief, right, of anger. Right? Others need Christians who are able to talk about a hope that addresses these emotions, doesn't ignore it, not gloss over it. As one of our colleagues says, we don't need more happy, clappy, never been discouraged word, uh, words congregations. If our hope is in the Lord, it needs to be a hope that not only calls us to recognize reality, but also calls us to refuse to accept this reality as a status quo. Right? Rooted in our biblical faith, this hope shapes our lives and our future as we work with God and the world towards peace and wholeness, as we model and live how we can be radical advocates for justice of substance and correctiveness of concreteness of change. This is a search for hope that, that, we can, that can give us courage and strength to stare down evil in the world, reject it, even in its seemingly, seemingly inevitability, 
and choose life when standing in the shadow of the cross. That's a community of Christians in First Peter. They realize that their faith puts them at odds with their broader community. And we may find ourselves pulled away from that status quo. I mean, the status quo doesn't always reflect the will of God, does it? I mean, we may discover that the status quo, even in some of our congregations, may be less reflective of the movement of God and set in place by our own stiff necks. Yet the hope in the Lord that we hold on to draws us to something beyond ourselves, to, to Christ, to God, to something deeper. It's not about always feeling good or positive, but about this new narrative, actually not even a new narrative, a timeless narrative that we are a part of. Authentic Christian hope is about addressing our past, but being open about the wrongs in our systems and working towards setting things right, realizing that the future does not need to be a mere repetition of the past. It's not about dreaming a new reality, but embracing the promise of God in this reality, not ignoring the suffering around us or suffering in history, but by placing our hope, our hope, in God. Now, God frees us in this hope from captivity. Frees us from the captivity to repeat the past and to transform this world into God's new world. I say that can be scary. It can be frightening to think about letting go of the things that have given us a sense of security or have been meaningful over time. Right? Things that we, we have found hope in that perhaps haven't really been fulfilling, but yet we still cling on to them because by letting go, we're not sure what will happen next. Maybe it's because we've been burnt so many times by the things we have placed our hope in that we don't know how to live life without struggling to find something to hold on to performance enhancing substances or without cutting corners at work or without manipulating others in our relationships or trying to ignore what is going on in our communities. But by letting go and following into this hope of Christ, we can find ourselves, we can find our faith being strengthened a little bit each more each time. I remember being young. Right? Well, there's lots of stories from when I was young. I remember one specific time when I was out in the Chesapeake Bay as a child. We were on a small fishing trawler, um, and I, I don't quite remember how we got on it. It was one of those things where it was a family friend's friend, and their family friend wanted to go out on his birthday. All I remember is this was not a this was not a tourist fishing trawler. This was something that was a working fishing trawler that someone decided to take us out on for deep sea fishing um, out in the middle of nowhere. And that's what I remember. I remember being far enough out in the water in the Chesapeake Bay that we could not see any land around us. Now, I was six or seven. I was not a fisherman. And this was not very exciting for me. So you can imagine as an antsy little six or seven year old how, how I was bouncing around the boat at the time. And I remember at one point on this sunny, cloudless day that all of a sudden the sky grew dark. I remember the captain of the ship running and grabbing the anchor and pulling the anchor up and yelling at everyone to pull their lines in and fasten everything down. And he got behind, it's not a steering wheel, right? Do we have any nautical people here? He got behind the, shout it out, shout it out. 
U.S. Navy veteran. Amen. Well, ignore my ignore my um, my ignorance with the, with book terms, but he got behind the the steering wheel. He remember him going as fast as he could back to land. And in my mind, I remember the water coming up and over our boat, just like you would have seen it in the perfect storm. But again, I was sick, so I'm not quite sure if this is just even more. If I imagine this as a, as a child, but I remember it starting to rain, and I, I, felt, I felt sick. And I couldn't, I couldn't keep myself standing up. I was over the railing, looking down below at the waters, at the waves coming up and over. And I must have looked pretty green, because I remember somebody coming up behind me, getting down, putting their hand on me, and saying, don't look at the waves. Look out towards the horizon. Now, I was still scared, but I began to get my bearings when I just readjusted my gaze. And another theologian, Kierkegaard, he writes about how when the sailor is out on the ocean, that the professional sailor knows that when everything is changing all around them, that when the waves are being born and dying, as Kierkegaard says, the sailor knows not to look down at the waves, because those waves are constantly changing. Rather, an experienced sailor knows to look up at the stars, because there, the stars have been for the generations past and the generations yet to come. By what means, Kierkegaard asks, do we conquer the changeable? By the eternal. By the eternal, one can conquer the future because the eternal is the ground of the future and therefore through it, the future can be fathomed. How do we, disciples of Christ, fellow brothers and sisters, how do we conquer this changing world around us? By looking at the eternal, the hope in Christ. Amen.